You are watching Grassroots Community Television, helping you make television people watch everywhere. Broadcasting on cable channel 82 in Glenwood Springs and Carbondale, and channel 12 in Aspen, Snowmass, Basalt, and Elder Bell. Free over-the-air broadcasts throughout the Roaring Fork Valley. All programs can be watched anytime, anywhere at grassrootstv.org. Welcome to tonight's Naturalist Night. Um, we are here tonight with ACES, with the Wilderness Workshop, and with the Roaring Fork Autobahn. Um, we also, big thank you to Two Leaves and a Bud for the tea that you are all hopefully enjoying. Um, this part of our series, next week we'll have Peter McBride, and he'll be talking about his photojournalism on the Colorado River. Uh, but tonight we have Kim Potter from the U.S. Forest Service. She is a uh, field biologist, um, been working with black swifts since 1995. Uh, a lot of cool stuff with their migration, and so we'll have Kim take it away. <laughs> Thank you, Rachel. Okay. Oh, it's a good crowd tonight. A lot of people here. Um, can I start with asking you a couple questions? Could you raise your hands for me? Uh, who's actually seen a black swift before? Let's see what percentage we have. Okay, so maybe 5%, something like that? Okay, how many have seen a bald eagle before? Okay, well there's one of the reasons why black swifts are so cool, because not everybody usually gets to see them. Um, can you hear me all right back there? Okay. Um, so. But I'd like to make sure that all of you can get a chance to see black swifts. Um, the best place to see a black swift is at, uh, let, me, let me get started here. Okay, the coolest bird. At Box Canyon Falls. This is in Uray. It's, it's absolutely the best place in Colorado and the West, maybe even in the world, to see black swifts because they're right there in the canyon. It's only a 10 minute walk from downtown and it also has Sue Hirschman at uh, Black Swift Falls at the park. Sue Hirschman's been working as a volunteer for 16 years, and she's there some part of every day during the breeding season. So if you go to Box Canyon, the best time to go is during the Black Swift breeding season between 13 June and 15 September, so yeah, right, right during that period of time. And be sure and contact Sue or give Box Canyon a call and ask them when Sue Hirschman's going to be there. Because Sue Hirschman will take you along this walkway and she will show you black swift nests, she will show you black swifts. Um, when you're standing at the top of a canyon like this and you're looking down into a canyon, you can't see a black swift nest because they're concealed from predators. And if you're walking along the river, you can't see the nest because they're concealed from predators for down below. So if you use a walkway like this, you're right in the, the niches and the places where they put their nests, and Sue will show them to you with a little laser, and it's a good experience. She can answer all your questions. She'll be your personal tour guide. Mm -hmm. So like I've said, she's been there for over 16 years, and 10 years ago, she, uh, we put her information together. She's put all kinds of observations together of black swifts on the nest. She's the best of what we know of for citizen science. And in Box Canyon, it's uh, the largest colony of black swifts that we know of in the state and anywhere. And it's one of the oldest ones. It was first discovered in the 1950s when they were looking for black swifts. So Sue's done a lot of work with the, with the black swifts in Box Canyon. And she has probably pulled together the largest data set on the breeding biology of black swifts than, that we have for Colorado. It's probably the best data set for any, uh, any place in the world. Nobody can beat this one. 
So Box Canyon is the place to go see a black swag. Um, so to understand why black swifts are different and what's unique about them, let's just kind of talk about, it's a, it's a migra neotropical migratory bird. So generally, neotropical migratory birds, small birds, they get back to the U.S. to breed about the middle of May, 15 May, and then they'll build nest and they'll do a little courtship and maybe three eggs or three weeks incubating eggs and another three weeks raising their youngsters and then that's about it. The youngsters jump out of the nest, beg for food, and, and they fly off. The birds will either have one clutch or two clutches, and by 15 August, they're gone. They're out of here. So that's generally what the birds do. But black swifts do different things. All right, let's do a little black swift trivia here. Uh, their wings are way longer than their body. They're really long and narrow, so the places that they live behind waterfalls tend to have a, a, a real dramatic landscape with it, cliffs and, and uh, places with uh, overview of the landscape. They have little tiny legs, and when they take off, they'll just, they'll fly. Their aerodynamics are such that they just take off right from where they're at. They're not broad flat wings, so they're not going to get a lot of lift and circle and circle like hawks and other raptors do. So they just have long, uh, narrow wings, about seven and a half inches. They weigh about an uh, ounce and a half or two, which is about eight quarters. So they don't weigh very much. The oldest bird is that we know of was 10 years and a month. Um, and they're as fast as a peregrine. They're pretty cool birds. All right, so we'll go a little bit on the biology of the black swifts. Well, we don't know where they migrate from. We don't know where they go in the winter. We don't know how they get there. We do know that some birds stopped for a while in Costa Rica for two different years for about a week and roosted on some steep banks of a, a graveled out river gorge. And that's it. That's what we know of their migration. And that's what we know of where they are in the winter time. Now, remember the little migratory birds, they get here about 15 May. Well, black swifts don't get here till around 15 June. Okay, that's totally different. And they have a lot of sight fidelity. They always come back when they can to the very same place that they um, raised their first youngsters at. Not only do they want to come back to the same colony site at the waterfalls, they, come, they will come back to the very same nest year after year. And they usually have the same mate unless something happens, they'll grab another mate. They only lay one egg. I can only think of two other land birds that, that do that. Uh, Bantail pigeons and the old passenger pigeon that's long gone. Can you think of any others, Al? I know some of the seabirds, pelagic seabirds, alcids and uh, storm petrels and other kinds of birds lay just one egg. But that's totally unique. Even the other western swifts that we have, uh, voxa swift, uh, white-throated swift or chimney swift, they all lay four to five eggs, just one single egg. Okay, so their nestling period is 48 days. Remember typical little bird, three weeks and he's gone? This is seven weeks. That's an amazing length of time. Uh, it's thought that the adults forage all day long once the little guys are, uh, can take care of themselves, once they can self-thermoregulate. So they forage all day, maybe up to 15 miles, and eat, uh, pick up bugs that are up in the air, uh, and come back at night. And then all night long, they'll uh, periodically feed their youngsters. So it's kind of a backward schedule that way. And they fledge. They begin fledging at the end of August. OK, by August 15th, all the other birds are gone. These guys begin fledging at the end of August. Most of them are gone by the middle of September in a typical year, and sometimes not until October. And they don't hang around on the fence and wait for mom and dad to feed them. The second they leave that nest, they migrate. They're gone. They don't come back the next night. They're gone. So they do a lot of really neat things. Oh, OK, there's always exceptions. Well, last year we had a really cold spring, a really late spring. And this female didn't lay her egg until August 15th. Well, not lay her egg. Her egg didn't hatch until August 15th. And then 
her kid didn't take 48 days till it flew from the nest. It took 58. That's over eight weeks. And that's a brand new record in itself. This bird fledged the next day. And that's another one of Sue's. And if you go to Box Canyon, you'll probably see this nest. And you'll probably see that female if you go next summer. Sue will be able to show you that. Alrighty. So... Some of the reasons that we don't know where they go is because they're so hard to find in um, South America. Some of those countries, they th we think they go to South America. There's a lot of swifts in those countries, and they just look like that little flying cigar. So they're really difficult to um, differentiate between the swifts. We've banded over 200 swifts, which isn't very many for a bird species. Uh, and there's never been any band recoveries outside the United States. But there are some things we do know about them. We know they live behind waterfalls or next to waterfalls or on cliffs near water. We know that um, we know something about their distribution. They're, they're a western bird. We know they're up in Alaska, but we haven't been able to find any nesting up there. We know that they go down through Mexico. We know of maybe two nests down in Mexico. There's another subspecies in Central America and another species, subspecies in the Caribbean. So we know a little bit that way, but we really don't know that much. So we know of two nests ever in Mexico, one nest ever in Costa Rica, none in Alaska, none in Wyoming, none in Nevada. And the heart of their range are through uh, mountain ranges, the Sierras and Cascades and Rocky Mountain ranges. Okay, but you have to say, Colorado has a leg up on everybody. We know our black swifts. We know a lot about black swifts. And that is, a lot of it is because of this guy right here, El Nor. We have to tell a little bit of a story about him. He showed up in Colorado in about 1937, and he was going to go to the School of Mines. He came from back east somewhere, and he started working with the Museum of Nature and Science with uh, uh, Niedrich, Bob Niedrich. And if, if you're a birder, you know of the Birds of Colorado, the two great big red volumes bird books. And this was before the uh, museum published these. And the uh, museum workers wanted to know more about Colorado birds. So they asked Al to help him out and look at swifts and some other birds. He did that for a while and decided that uh, he didn't like the School of Mines, so he went into the Army for a while. World War II hit. He went to the Battle of the Bulge and all kinds of hair-raising events, but came back to Colorado when he was finished and went to school in Colorado Springs. And he worked again for the guys at the museum looking for black swifts. He thought, well, I can, I can put this job to work, and I can make my thesis black swifts. That'll work well. And if I'm going to do black swifts, I'm going to need to learn how to climb. So he taught himself how to climb. And then as part of his income, he climbed around on the, uh, the rocks at the Garden of the Gods in Colorado Springs and would pull hardware out and sell it to climbers and, and for scrap metal. <laughs> so he started looking for black swift nests, started in the San Juans where the collectors had collected birds. And he found uh, Box Canyon in about 1950. And he climbed into that place, and, and uh, before that, he called the, the USGS, who controls banding for birds. And he said, what size band should I put on a black swift? And I go, well, you know, nobody's ever banded a black swift before, so you're on your own there. So they sent him some bands. He climbed in and put, tucked the birds into his pockets and went down, banded the first birds ever, and then climbed back up, put him in their nest, and by then it was so dark that he had to spend the rest of the night hanging in a hammock in the canyon, okay? In a cold, wet, damp canyon. It couldn't have been very fun. But before he was done and finished with his thesis, he had found 27 colonies. Even that work alone was more than anything else that, was, that we knew, that, that, that blows everybody else out of the water immediately. During his thesis work, he didn't just look at distribution of birds. He figured out some things about black swifts that have really held up today. He came up with about six ecological requirements that he decided, if you're going to look for a black swift, where is it going to live? These are what you look for. 
flowing water, permanent water. So it can be a trickle, it can be a torrent, it can be hanging lake. And that's one of the ecological factors. All right, um, these two we kind of combined. The commanding view over the terrain, and that's because of the not being able to get lift with the wings that back off and over just like peregrines nest on the cliffs, black swifts, the same concept. Um, and unobstructed access. You know, sometimes when you're in the woods, you come across a waterfall and it's deep in the woods and there's trees all the way around and snags all over the place. The swifts could get back into that spot, but they can't get out very well, especially when the air is heavy in the morning. So unobstructed access is another um, identifier. Al. <laughs> a safety meeting. <laughs> they nest in places that are inaccessible to terrestrials, uh, predators. So the, the aerial predators, typically you can't see a nest from up on top, and typically you can't see it from the bottom, and you can't get to it very easily. Um, Al described these birds as putting their nest in places where the sun, sun doesn't shine. Rarely will you find a nest in a location where the sun actually shines on it all day long. It might pass across the nest for a little bit of time, but just a little bit of time. Al also taught us that if you're going to look for black swifts in the daytime or at nighttime, use a spotlight and you can get red eye shine. Or if in the daytime, take a big mirror and you can shine it in some nooks and crannies like that and you can see what's in there. The other characteristic, they need a place to put their nest. They need niches. If it's that smooth sandstone waterfalls like Hayes Creek Falls, there's not going to be any niches for the birds and there probably won't be any nests in there. We had a lot of discussions with Al and he didn't like this very much, but we found in the southern Rocky Mountains that moss was pretty regularly present whenever there were black swifts around. And we added that as a characteristic. So Al did all this work in the 50s and came up with 20 nests. And then there was another big surge of um, work around, oh, mid 19, 1995 when the Forest Service designated it as a sensitive species. And then the Heritage Program and the Rocky Mountain Bird Observatory and the Forest Service and, and, and volunteers got together and um, we did kind of a 10-year survey, you might say. It, it, we just kept building on the knowledge. We developed a protocol and um, or first of all, we put a database together of all the waterfalls, went through all the maps, went through the Colorado Waterfalls book and just made a big database of waterfalls in the state, ranked them high, low, priority. And then we went to those places to visit them. And we put together a, sorry about this part, um, a ranking sheet, you know, a survey sheet for people and said, okay, when you go to these places, would you please tell us if there's moss there, rank it one, if there is, isn't any, rank it five if it's all over the place. If there's a lot of water, rank it five for strong. If there isn't, mark it zero. And we'll add up the score in the end and see how that comes. So we had training sessions, so everybody was kind of evaluating things the same way. And in the end, we evaluated 369 sites in uh, the Southern Rocky Mountains in New Mexico and Colorado. Discovered another 70, 71 new nests. That's great. All of them were at waterfalls, except one site was at a cave. So we got a lot of information back. We published some of that, and we were able to develop a model out of it, and yeah, Nora was right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> those, those characteristics all work. They predicted to 94.5% of the time whether a, a, a waterfall would be occupied by a black swift or not using those characteristics. We thought that... Um, we got some population estimates out of the work as well. We found out that uh, Box Canyon Falls is the largest, the largest colony in Colorado with about 18 nesting pairs. And there were a lot of small colonies with only one nesting pair. Uh, got some population estimates out of it. And we found out that uh, waterfalls aren't randomly pl placed across the landscape. And so... Um, Black swift nests aren't randomly placed either. They're, they, where the waterfalls are is where the black swifts are. Let me just get this straight for a second here. 
when we were looking at these things, water and shade and the moss seemed like maybe something else was going on. So we decided we would take a look. Maybe that was all about temperature and humidity instead of just shade and, and water and, and moss. So we set out about 42 data loggers. Uh, they collect temperature and humidity readings. And we thought, well, this would be a good time to do this. For about five years, we put them out at nine different colonies across the southern Rocky Mountains. We thought, well, we'll just get a snapshot in time in the late 21st century of what uh, the habitat is like in a microclimate where the nest is. So we found out that um, these birds, typically, it's 49 degrees at the nest, and it's 90% humidity. And it was very similar for every single place that we put these at. And no matter what the temperature was outside, whether it was, uh, whether it was peak heat of the day between 3 and 4, or whether it was the peak cold between 6 and 7, the temperature was still barely barely um, affected by that. It was always close to 49 degrees and 90% and humidity. So we put a little baseline work together on that. Okay, so when you complete projects like that, you go, okay, it just leaves so many questions. We still don't know where they go. We still don't know how they get there. Um, we don't know if they make little stops along the way and, and feed in some very rich places along the way that are really important for conservation. And we don't know if they just meander down there or if they just get there. So uh, we decided that that would be a pretty good thing to look at. I've been working with Jason Beeson from the Rocky Mountain Bird Observatory and Carolyn Gunn. She is a, a, a veterinarian and now works as a a fish pathologist for the department of what is it parks and wildlife now so she fixes she takes care of all the sick fish in the entire state so we were all working with black swifts during this whole process beforehand and some grants were becoming available and another study had a bird some thrushes come back and they had little devices on them called geolocators and jason says you guys let's put some geolocators on black swifts and we'll see where they go I said, no, nah, Jason, you know, we're, we're waiting for satellites. Maybe three years, we put some requests in, and we can put satellites on them. No, 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 let's do geolocators. We can find out sooner. So we did. We, we bought some. We went to the Audubons. They bought us two right here in the Roaring Fork Valley. And so we decided to put some geolocators on the birds. Geolocators, what are they? They're these teeny tiny things. We couldn't put satellites on. They're just too expensive for us and not small enough for swifts yet. But we could put these geolocators on. The British, um, British Antarctic Research Station developed uh, geolocators for albatross. Okay, albatross about this tall, not seven inch wingspan, seven foot wingspan, <laughs> or just one wing. But they did make their product small enough that we could actually put them on the birds. Um, it only weighs about 1.2 grams, so we can do that. We absolutely can do that. Now, the principle of these are they store data. There's a light sensor on it, so it looks at what it, when sunset is. It gets an angle when the sun is at a low angle, so it, it records sunset and sunrise and then records the data with a clock in it. And we can retrieve this, and if you know... Uh, how long the day is, you can figure out the latitude, and if you know what time is noon, you can figure out the longitude. So days are longer and shorter in Alaska. Days are equal at the equator. Uh, the, it's high noon in Massachusetts at a different time than it is in California. So if you can figure out when is high noon and when is sunset and sunrise, you can figure out where you are in the world generally. So that's the whole theory on the geolocators. Well, Geolocators had a few challenges. Uh, we couldn't figure out how to attach them at first because they don't come with any little strings or anything. So we looked at some studies, and they had some great leg loop designs. Um, so we went to Jason's organic farm in Paonia, and we caught some of his sparrows, and we, we put some harnesses on them, and wow, that worked really well. Okay, we can do this. Yeah, we can do this. But their, but their legs are 
this is a dipper, it's not a sparrow, but they have really long legs. And so we tried out, for the first time when we were catching black swifts at Zapata Falls, we tried out our design, but black swifts don't have legs. They don't have hardly any leg at all. So, uh-oh, what are we going to do? Whoops. So we went back to the drawing board, and we came up with another design, and it worked pretty well. Instead of putting legs on, like a, a, a harness that a climber uses and a backpack, we just put a backpack on and, and, and stitch it in the front, like you clip your backpack. And it, it worked fine. It worked great. Um, of all the times, we, we deployed four of these, and we got three back. And the only one that had any damage on the harness system was, was one that went with a transmitter like this. And there was a little fraying from the loop. We didn't have any sores on the birds. We didn't have any, any bad spots on them or loss of feathers. They worked. It worked really well. Um, we had the harnesses mostly put together. And then we sewed them on when we tightened the last strap by sewing it and put a little super glue on it. It, it, it worked really good. It was cold, it was wet, it was dark when we were doing it, and we did it by a headlamp, you know, no big deal. Okay, the next big challenge with data loggers, you can deploy them, but if you want the data that's in here, you have to get it back, okay? Well, we thought, hey, we can do that. Remember, swifts always come back to their same colony, and they'll even come back to the same nest? Great. And we've got a place that we think we can do this. We've got a cave. So we definitely got a captive audience. We put some nets across the front of the cave and caught birds. This is a Fulton Resurgence cave. It's a limestone cave in the flat tops. Uh, it's one of the largest. It's not as big as Box Canyon, but it has about 11 nesting pair in there. So it's a, it's a good population to work with. And we've been banding youngsters in there since about 1998. So we have a good feel for the cave. We know that we can work in there. And with our captures, we recaptured for about 41% of the birds that we've banded. So a lot of the birds are coming back. It's, we think it's going to work there. So we deployed, we were going to deploy all four from this location. We ended up deploying three of them, two on, man, uh, two on females and one on a male. And the fourth one, we put the whole system on, and it just seemed a little bit too tight. It, it just it wasn't right, so we cut it off, and we didn't have a backup. So we were done there. We retrieved two of them from this site the next year, and both the females. We, don't, we didn't see the male. Uh, either we didn't catch it, because we can't go all the way to the top with the nets, but we just didn't get that third one back. Fulton Resurgence Cave itself has a few challenges. It's uh, in the wilderness area. It's about a three-hour, four-by-four drive once you get to Rifle, and then from Rifle you have to four-wheel drive back for about three hours up to the portal. We usually center tents up, and then you hike for another two hours and drop down about 1,200 feet. First off one cliff to the, off of Blair Mountain and then off the next bench to the cave. So it's, it's a bit, bit of a hike. Um, we're usually finished about 7 o'clock and 7.30, 8 maybe at the latest, and then we have to hike back up. We usually get out at midnight when we do this. Um, so we still had one geolocator left. We said, Sue, Sue, Hirschman, help us. We've got this geolocator. Do you have a nest that we can get to? And she said, oh, sure. So we went. We used ladders and just a hand net, and it was just a drive-by. It was really great. <laughs> we, <laughs> we put a geolocator on a mail there. And then Sue, the next summer, said, the pair's back. Come on in. We grabbed the bird, took the geolocators off, and we know for sure that the pair, the male, from Box Canyon successfully raised a chick, and they were fine that year. We don't know from Fulton Resurgence Cave because we use the mist nets, and we don't know exactly where the bird went to which net or to which nest. So, all right. So, the big news. My dad told me today that if you look in the National Geographic bird book, he said. Hey, Kim, did you know that in the National Geographic um, bird book, it says they don't know where they go for the winter? Well, we do. I go, Dad, we know now. We know. We know where they go. Um, 
We didn't have good luck with the fall migration route because it was near the fall equinox when the days are the same. So the days were the same for a lot of miles, and it was difficult to interpret that data. But we had really good data points for their return back at spring migration. And you can see these are the three different um, locators that we had. We found out that they were traveling about 200 miles a day on the way down and about 250 miles on the way back. They didn't seem to stop anywhere in particular uh, as a staging area. They didn't seem to forage. They just bolted. And we thought, well, does, do those routes need to be adjusted? Do we need to adjust the data? Um, because they seem to be over sea instead of over land. But we took a look at the prevailing winds throughout that area, and they, they don't they line up somewhat the, with the migration route. So maybe the insects are flying across that way. They might be going out with insect flow. Those are algae growths um, in the small map. Could be more food, could be more uh, aquatic insects for them to eat. So they made the big, de the big trip to western Brazil in Amazonia. They spent the winter down there. All three of these birds went generally to the same location. Um, lowland rainforest of western Brazil. If you had asked me where to go look for black swifts in the wintertime, I would have said, wow, they live at waterfalls and steep cliffs up here in the breeding season. Let's go to the Andes. And that isn't where they went. They went over the lowland and, I guess, over the tropical forest, as best we know. The geolocators are plus or minus 100 kilometers. They're not precise, but this is a pretty long distance, so it's, it's a good picture of, uh, of where they're going. Oh, where in Central America did they touch down? You didn't say what. They look like our biggest over it. I th that we don't know if they're touching down oh. or if they're going down. That's one of the big questions we don't know about black swifts on their trip. We've looked at um, common swifts in Europe and the pallid swift. These birds never roost. I, I mean, they roost. But when they're not breeding, they can, they can stay on wing for nine months at a time and never roost. We don't know if black swifts do that. They might do that. So we don't know for sure if the morning sunrise position was taken and then if they're on the wing all the time, the evening position, they may be another 100 miles down the road. So we don't know exactly how accurate those positions were that came with the data loggers. However, they traveled uh, about 200 miles a day still their routes, they were at those places somewhere along that route. And so we don't know if they, if they sat down in Central America or if they just flew all night long or if they foraged all night long or if they just cock one wing and then go kind of in a circle while they sleep. I mean, we just don't know. Uh, we had some people from Belgium email us today. They said, how did you adjust for if they're aerial roosters? And we went, oh, we really didn't. We just said, we don't know, and that could be the case. So there's a lot of things we still don't know. We looked at the habitat just a little bit. And the gray area is where all three of them spent some time. And it is, you know, the, the white, white peaks are the Andes, right? And so they've spent time down in those lowland areas. So they just must be over the canopy getting insects and, and whatnot. So, um, we, we don't know, so we, come, so we decided that um, we don't really know if all the swifts from North America go to the same place or not. And we thought, well, gee, okay. We did this, uh, we did this study, and it came out pretty well, and it was really stressful, and we didn't want to do this again until Jason calls again, just like he did before in 2009, and said, hey, you guys. Some grants are coming due. Would you like to, uh, is there anything you'd like to maybe apply for? And we said, no, we don't want to do this again. And then we went, oh, maybe. Do all the black swifts of North America go to the same place that our Colorado black swifts go? We don't know, but we sure would like to know. So we picked out a few places that might represent, number one, hopefully a drive-by, but where you can actually get your hands on a swift or a swift nest. 
Um, this place is St. Charles River on the Front Range over by Colorado Springs-ish, and we already put a geolocator out on that bird, and it had a colony of three birds, and we put a geolocator on the female from that colony in 2009, and we retrieved it just last summer. She came back. We took the geolocator off. She and her mate both successfully raised a youngster, too, at that colony. So of the three birds, all of them came back, and we got the geolocator. And the geolocator location looks very, very similar to where the other three went. Okay, these are small data points, but they're still telling us something that nobody else knows. So next spring, we're going to go to Jemez Falls in uh, New Mexico. And that's a place where we can, it's a, it's a more southern location. We think that St. Charles is an eastern location. Uh, there's been a lot of research done in California in this area um, near Riverside and the San Bernardino Mountains, I think it is, at Lowler Falls. We're going to uh, put a, some geolocators out at that location. And another place that we think we can reach birds is up in Idaho around Fern Falls. It's a real small and shadow falls place we can actually reach them. So we're going to try and hit the compass points of their range to some degree and then take a look and see if those birds go to the same place as our Colorado birds do. That's definitely got some um, conservation implications if they're all going to exactly the same place. Some of the um, projections for that area of the rainforest were 30% deforestation by 2050 in that same general area that, that these, were go these birds were going to in the wintertime. So there's definitely some things to consider there. It, it appears that there's some connectivity between the populations distributed across North America by going to the same wintering area. But we don't know for sure how much they interact down there because we think most of their courtship happens up at their breeding areas. And um, so we're also going to look at genetics this time. We thought that some of the genetics work was going to cost $20,000, $30,000 to make some markers, some satellite markers for birds, because uh, we've heard that it's difficult to get enough markers to say things about birds. But we talked to some people in um, Fort Collins. Sarah Euler McCants has worked a lot with the Gunnison sage grouse. Uh, Jessica Young did the physical dynamics of the sage grouse and determined the two separate species. And Sarah did her dissertation on the genetics of it and, and proved without a doubt that they, that they reached some bottleneck way back in geologic time and are definitely two different species. So we talked to Sarah about maybe taking this project on with us. And she said, we can do this. This is fine. It's not going to cost you $20,000. We can make markers and probably get at least 17 markers to look at for black swifts for around $3,500. And we said, OK, um, how many blood samples do we need to get? She goes, no, 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 no. All you need to do is send me a feather. I can get DNA from feather these days. So we've already collected some blood for the Smithsonian for their genetics bank. Uh, we have some blood on tap. and. We have some other blood. Uh, this is kind of a side story, but at Fulton Resurgence Cave, where we work with the cave and have been banding birds there for since 1998, four of the nestlings have returned. And those nestlings were all female. None of them were males. And, and, and that's really interesting because typically in, well, maybe in the old days in the people world, but definitely in the animal world in the kingdom, the males tend to go back to where the parents were and bring their mate home. And the females go off with the in-laws. And that's, and that's how you exchange genetics, and it's how things tend to go in the animal world. But we're seeing that only the females are coming back. We're not seeing any males coming back. And some species do that. Some of the ducks do that. Uh, some of the, the northern, like, eiders and, and old squaws and a few different ducks will do that. But most species, it's the other way around. I think sage grouse are the same way because the females are the ones that uh, take off and, and hold the site fidelity, and the males just go all over the place. So this is really interesting. And we can look at this genetically as well. Um, and so with just feathers, we can collect feathers. These are different places on the map with the triangle where we might be able to collect feathers. But we were looking at this paternity, and some of the people I consulted about it said, no, you can't tell those are females because 
the guide that we use to um, determine males and females is called the pile guide. Pile's wrong. Uh, you can't tell a male from a female based on the fork of the tail and the white feathers. It, it, it's, it, you can't say they're females, so we started taking cards with and getting a dot of DNA and doing paternity testing. So we have all those cards. So we've got 30 of those cards, and we've got 30 feathers. So we've already got a whole bunch of, a whole bunch of specimens to go to look at different things in genetics. We, our bottlenecks, our, is there gene flow between them? All kinds of things. Uh, down in Mexico, where there's, that, there's only two nests, and then Central America is another subspecies, we don't really know which subspecies is in Mexico and nesting. We might be able to clear up some of the questions on subspecies down there, too. So we've got a lot of really exciting things to, to look forward to there. We're really excited. Our work on, with the geolocators is going to be published in this coming uh, Wilson Journal of Ornithology. It's the very lead article of 2012. And um, Dr. Braun has um, commissioned an art piece for the frontispiece for us. It's Don Radovich, who taught art at Gunnison for a long time. And it's going to be an artwork of Black Swift's uh, from Box Canyon, some, something of that nature. So we're really excited about that. Audubon came with us, National Audubon came with us to uh, Fulton Resurgence Cave last year when we took some of the geolocators off. And uh, they also went to Box Canyon and took pictures. That This year there'll be an article in National Audubon Magazine on the Black Swift work. And the Smithsonian came out to St. Charles, which was that far eastern over by Colorado Springs site, and um, there'll be a, an article in the Smithsonian this year too, so there should be some real fun pictures and reading. Oh, like I said, these uh, Audubon's helped us buy geolocators, and we really, really appreciate it. And we had a lot of help from, from all kinds of people on this project. Uh, one of my friends, Rich Levod, Started with the Black Swifts with me in 1995. We, we just went crazy over Black Swifts. There's a judge, a retired judge in Glenwood Springs, Vic Serby. He's an avid birder. And he told me, oh, you can find Black Swifts up at Hanging Lake. No problem. I found an article that said Dead Horse Creek. And Dead Horse Creek is Hanging Lake. Just go put your back against a rock and use your binoculars and you'll find Black Swifts. Well, I went there three times. And I never saw black swift. Mm -hmm. So it took a long time to figure out how to see black swifts. I should have gone to Box Canyon. Mm -hmm. um, so Rich and I did a lot of black swift work for a long time. And, and we spent a lot of hours sitting around the campfire figuring out different questions to ask and different things to do. And uh, he, ALS took, or Lou Gehrig's disease took Rich. But before, while he was, before he went crazy because all he could use were about this much, he typed up a whole book on the stories of black swifts. It's called The Coolest Bird. And if you're interested in swifts at all, you can get it for free online. All you have to do is just Google it, and you can print it, you can read it. It's all kinds of good stories. He tells way better story about Al Noor and all these people that have come before than, than I do. You might enjoy that. So um, I guess at that point, do I have anything else on there? Whoops, I went right on out of it. So um, we've got some time for a couple of questions. Yeah. Do you have questions? Liz. How do we get the ladder in the cave? How do we get the ladder in the cave? Those are wildlife ladders. <laughs> They're six foot tall each sections, and they weigh 10 pounds each. And uh, you can carry them. You can get volunteers to carry them. <laughs> Hopefully. So we can, we can hike those in and out, and they usually send me up the ladder. <laughs> and that's how we, uh, it, they come apart, and they're aluminum. They travel pretty well. Are they afraid of us because of their remoteness? Are they not afraid of, are they not afraid of us because of their remoteness and, their, and they don't see um, people very often? The youngsters, the adults get nervous if we come around and they will flush off the nest. 
the youngsters, we just cl I just climb up the ladder and I just grab it. And, and then come back down the ladder and we band it, process it, and then I walk back up and set it back on the nest again. So they are curious. They always turn around and watch us, but they're not afraid of us. Do you never get attacked by the parents? No. Usually the adults are off foraging when we're in there. You can get quite close to the adults. Um, they, will f they will flush off of the nest. And if we're not catching adults with a mist net, sometimes we'll spotlight them and have a ladder put up ahead of time and then spotlight them and then just reach up and grab them. Or we made nets. We took a fishing, a fish net when you catch a fish, and we ch exchanged the netting on that for mist netting. And we put them on poles and so we can catch them that way too. And uh, they're quite calm when they're in the hand. They wiggle just like uh, any bird that you're banding. So they do show some fear, but the youngsters certainly don't. They don't know what's going on at all. Some other questions? Are you going to have any banding days um, of the changing species, um, the rosy finches at SOAS? Are you going to get any that these folks might be able to watch you band? Um, Just the, in case. We've, we've been banding black swifts, or uh, mm -hmm. rosy finches, on snow mass from, what were those years? 2007 through 2011 on snow mass, Al and Dick Philby have, and snow mass ski area have bird feeders up on the mountain. And for a while, we were banding rosy finches and putting color bands on them and releasing them. We were trying to get estimates at the population size and some of the distribution on, on these rosy finches and the color bands we put on them for people with feeders to report back to us how far and wide these birds were dispersing. Our target species were brown-capped rosy finches, which are practically endemic to Colorado. And we did that f through 2011, and I put uh, bands on about 1,500 brown-capped rosy finches and about almost 2,000 rosy finches in general. But in order to get a population estimate on these birds, you need a good recapture rate. And we had so many rosy finches coming in from the Continental Divide that we were getting less than 0.07 return rate. And you need up to around 20% or 15% to make any statements or to, to crunch any numbers on that. So after attempting that for a while, we found out that that wasn't working and it wasn't the best process. So we just went to talking about rosy finches and, and climate change and what the alpine might look like with climate change and how it might affect rosy finches. And then this year we have um, budget cuts. So there are feeders at the Nature Center at Snowmass, and there's a lot of rosy finches coming to them, all three species, black rosy finches, brown-capped rosy finches, and gray-crowned rosy finches and many races of rosy finches, some of them from the Pacific coast, some of them from the interior U.S., and some of them from Canada. So it's a good opportunity to see them, but uh, that's the rosy finch deal. Okay. She doesn't understand the term uh, in-flight roosting. Is that when they're asleep and they are literally still on? The question was um, about in-flight roosting and aerial roosting. And today in the email, the um, gentleman that emailed me called it, quote unquote, aerial roosting. He goes, if you can call that roosting. So <laughs> basically, they don't come down to earth. They don't land on a tree. They don't land on a cliff. They stay in the air and, and fly 24-7 somehow. And they'll do it day after day. So common swifts have done that for nine months at a time if they're not breeding. And we didn't know that until we started looking at the data and, and crunching numbers. Same with the, the pallid swift, and we suspect it's the same case for many swifts. So do they think they're actually, they can't be asleep. They can't be awake. They can't. <laughs> <laughs> can, can they be asleep? They, they must be at some point. They must be. Al, do some of the pelagic birds do that? Are they on the wing all the time? Pelagic birds do that on a regular basis. 
these are these are birds that are ocean going that only come to land to um, lay their eggs and raise their youngsters and the whole rest of the year they're out at sea and and some of them will land on the water but a lot of them don't uh, they'll fly all night long they'll fly so Kim, what's your best guess about the population of black swifts in the world in the world um, we looked in the Rocky, southern Rocky Mountain region, which is a little bit of Wyoming, Colorado, and New Mexico, at somewhere at 1,000 to 1,500. I think the biggest densities are in the Pacific Northwest, in probably British Columbia and Oregon and Washington. And they're not, they're, there can't be just very many. 200,000 would be a lot. They're just not a very uh, densely populated species. What's their average lifespan? We we know that the oldest the the average lifespan. We're not sure what the average lifespan is, but we know that the oldest one that we've documented so far, and we haven't had all that many captures. If only two hundred have been banded, um, was ten years and one month. So. I would guess that these, it's not uncommon for these birds to be eight years old, six years old. Uh, I'm sure they live to be older than 10 years old too, probably 12. 14 would probably be a stretch. So that's my guesstimate. I just don't know for sure. Well, thank you, Kim. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you. I wanted to leave.